Well, good to be with you this morning. How are we to live as Christians? Um, that seems like that's an easy question. It's actually not as easy a question as you would like to think. Uh, people have struggled with this, and they've struggled with this for a long time. Uh, people will say, well, okay, well, what you have to do is you have to follow the Ten Commandments. That's what you have to do. Yet Scripture is pretty clear that we in the church, we are no longer underneath the law. There's many things in the Old Testament law which we do not keep anymore. Paul says circumcision. I said that's not necessary. The sacrifices aren't necessary. Many of the things which pointed at spiritual realities in the past, they are not for us today. Even the Ten Commandments, we'd say, well, those aren't really for us today. Though, to be fair, nine out of the Ten Commandments are reiterated in the New Testament. Uh, we don't find the Sabbath so much, but we do find the rest of them. So don't go out and murder, please. Okay, I appreciate that. If we look at Galatians chapter 3 and verse 23 through 25, it reads this way. Now, before faith, I think it probably should be better translated before the faith, before the faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the, the coming forth or until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now, now that faith or the faith has come, we are no longer under the guardian. The law has served its purpose. It's done what it's supposed to do. We are a different people, which once again gets me back to the first question, which I asked, then how are we as Christians to live? How do we live? Do we have a, do we have a law? Do we have a criteria, criterion? What, what, how do we do this? Um, Christian, once again, you're not free to steal. You're not free to commit adultery. You're not free to, to murder. Those things are clearly are told you in the New Testament. One of the things which we can find, there are things within the New Testament. We see, well, don't do this and don't do that. And so those things are very clear. Those are there. There are prohibitions. But we also find that there are prohibitions which we must put upon ourselves for the sake of others. For example, you have somebody who is a weaker Christian. That is, that they are new in the faith. Uh, they have doubts in some areas. And that you and your behavior, you're free and you can do whatever you want to do, but you decide to limit yourself so that you will, in your behavior, not cause the other person to stumble. You are not a stumbling block. And so therefore, that is how you are to live. You are to avoid things that are prohibited. You are to make sure that you don't weak, hurt the weaker Christian. You must ask the question, am I living in the way of love? For Christ says to, to live in love it's the, and, and to keep his commandments, that's the fulfillment of his law. So is it the way of love? Am I loving my neighbor as myself? Am I doing that? Many people say, well, it's according to the Spirit's leading, and I think that's very correct. However, here's the problem. I find that many people will go ahead and say, it's the Spirit's leading, but sometimes their determination as to what the Spirit's leading is is oftentimes very subjective. I've had people I've been in the midst of fights and tell me, well, I have prayed about this. I know, therefore, it is correct, yet I know they're involved in sin. Huh. I've seen both sides of, of, of conflict where people tell me that they've prayed about it and have completely different conclusions. Folks, how then are we to live? And it's difficult. And because there is that difficulty, we, we have people who will come in, they say, well, I know how, what we're going to do. We will have our own template. We will have our own paradigm, and we will lay it on top of Christianity, and we'll make Christianity work better. I'm here to tell you that's not right. We talked about that last week. Last week, we talked about the concept of it is subtraction by means of addition. We are not to go ahead and to add to Christ. We are to put Christ at the centerpiece and to get our nourishment from Christ. We are to get all things from Christ and not from self-made religion. This brings us then to the book of Colossians. And we come to Colossians in Colossians chapter 2. We finish up here finally the second chapter with this verse 16. We're going to go all the way through verse 23 this morning. So in Colossians chapter 2 verse 16, um, what Paul is doing is he's addressing, he's addressing his audience here. And he knows that his audience is struggling. He is struggling because there are people who are coming in. Perhaps they're well-meaning. Perhaps they are people who are mercenary. They're doing it for, for funds. But they're coming in, and they're trying to change Christianity, Christianity into their own making, a, um, a new type of religion, if you will. Perhaps it is a Jewish, perhaps a pagan combination. Again, we're not 100% certain because we do not have the doctrinal statement of the heretics. But here they come. And Paul will finish in his admonition against them here in verse 16 and following. He says, therefore, let no one, let no one pass judgment on you 
in questions of food and drink or with regard to festival or new moon or Sabbath. Don't let people come in and say, now this is what the truly God people do. And the truly godly people drink this or don't drink this, eat this or don't eat this, watch this observation or don't watch this observation or keep the Sabbath or, or do. And he says, don't let people do that. He said, what they're doing here is that they are adding things there. Jesus will set the foundation of the idea that all foods are, are clean. In Mark chapter 7 and verse 15, Jesus will say, it's not what enters into the man which defiles him, but what comes out of the heart. It's, it's not a food issue. Now, don't get me wrong. There were purity issues in the Old Testament, and those were there. But Jesus is, 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 is speaking that, you know what, in the future, this is not how it's going to be. I know lots of people who have lots of rules on what you can and cannot do, even regarding food and drink. Alcohol, of course, is a big, giant thing. Well, I won't get on there too much today. But I remember at my previous church, a very dry church, you know, um, pe- nobody drank anything. People didn't even dr- don't even look at it, you know. So. But I remember one day I'd made a mistake. And uh, I, no, I wasn't drinking. But, uh, but there I was with my Henry Weinhardt's draft brew root beer. It's pretty good, by the way, pretty good. And it was all, you know, I was having a nice drink and going across the church lawn. And I had later, later on at Sunday, probably sometime after church, an older woman came up to me to rebuke me of causing other people to stumble. I said, I wasn't drinking beer. I was having a, I was having a root beer. It's, it's alcohol free. It's okay. She says, well, but somebody might have had the wrong impression based upon the bottle. Folks, if we get to the point where we have to worry about the shape of the bottle in which we're drinking, we're in trouble. Okay? And what we've done is we've added a new paradigm on top of stuff. Be careful about this. Okay? That's, that, that's, that's not it. She could have stopped her car, by the way, as she drove by the church and said, hey, what's that? Okay? That's saying nothing about the consumption of alcohol in and of itself. It's just the appearance. People talk about uh, moons and new moons and festivals and that type of stuff. And it reminds me of, and I'm going to have you turn back here, go back to the book of Romans in Romans chapter 14. And Paul talks about this here as well. Again, you think this is not a small thing, but it's all over the place. We find it in the book of Colossians. We find it in the book of Romans. We find it in the book of 1 Corinthians. How does the Christian live? It is addressed many, many, many times. Uh, We'll find it in the book of Ephesians. Romans chapter 14, though, it's almost as if these are parallel passages. Verse 1, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let no one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Get along. Stop taking this artificial religion which you have added to Jesus Christ and go on ahead to, to, to judge one another, to despise one another. That's not how it's supposed to be. Verse 4, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before the, his own master that he stands and falls, and he will be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day. We move from food and drink, now we move to to days. One day is better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in the honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in the honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. Might I ask you this question, what you are doing, are you doing it for the glory of God, whether it be the consumption of something or, the abs- or being abstinent from it? Who is it for? That's a relevant question. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is where it melts down. It all sums itself up there. Is it for the Lord or is it not? Is it for the Lord or is it not? How then shall we live? Hmm. Again, just because there is such a thing as Christian freedom, it doesn't mean that you do whatever you want to. For you've been called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use that liberty as an occasion for the flesh, according to Galatians 5.13. No, no, no. There is self-limitation by the power of the Holy Spirit, by, co- by examining the, the, the situation in which you find yourself, to see if there's a weaker brother which you might cause to stumble. These are things which you, you put into effect. 
There is a grid, if you will, that you put into effect to, 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 to ask yourself, is this for the Lord? Is this for me? This is all very, very important. We come then back to Colossians in Colossians chapter 2. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to festival moon or a festival or new moon or Sabbath. These, these things are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. These are the forerunners. These are the things which are around the corner. When I first got married, I married not only my wife, but also her two cats. We had Ashes and Kiana. Ashes was a dumpy old cat. If cats could smile, she never would. If Kiana could smile, she would never stop. One was bouncy, the other one was frumpy. Kiana liked to play, Ashes did not, except for I remember one day. And in one day, they got themselves into a fight. There they were running all over the house. Kiana hit around the corner. She was trying to bait the old cat in. No, no. But Ashes was the old cat and a wily cat. And she walked up. And she saw the shadow of the young cat. She just ran around and grabbed her. She saw the shadow which was around the corner. That's how she knew what was to be. And so oftentimes we have these things in Old Testament law, such as the sacrifice, and we see the sacrifice, and it is a, it is a symbol, it is a shadow of that which is to come. And we see, the sh we see the shadow, and it is to lead us to the appreciation of the substance, and the substance, of course, is the great sacrifice of Christ. See? Isn't that marvelous? It is the foreshadow. Look over. We went through the book of Hebrews not too long ago, but look at Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, he will speak of these very same things. Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 1 through 4. For since the law, that's what we're talking about, right? For since the law has a shadow, there it is. For since the law has a shadow or a foreshadowing of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, that is the substance it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every take, take, excuse me, offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers have been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of the sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of goats or bulls and goats to take away sin. And so what we have here is we have blood and the blood of uh, bulls and goats, and it is a symbol, it is something, it is a shadow of what is to come. But when Christ comes, sacrifice comes to an end, for he has died completely for us, showing his sacrifice to be successful, rising from the dead. These things are a shadow, all of, the, all of this, this stuff here, Okay. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance or the body belongs to Christ. He, he, he warns them again. Hey, listen, listen, listen. He says, I, asked, I told you, don't let anybody pass judgment. Don't let anybody disqualify you. Don't anyone disqualify you insisting on several things. Asceticism, worship of angels, and going on a detail about visions. We look at this and say, oh my goodness, what is all this? Some of you are saying asceticism. Acetylene gas, no, not asceticism, okay? Asceticism is the idea that you're trying to live in poverty for the sake of getting God's attention, okay? We have many, many examples of this. You might remember that Martin Luther, okay? Martin Luther, the great reformer, was very much into asceticism, okay? Martin Luther was well known for sleeping on a bed of nails, for example. It's nice and cozy. Um, when that didn't seem to do the trick, he would go outside and he would uh, grab a blanket and he would sleep out in the snow. We are told of other monks and people like that in the past that they, they burned so strongly with, with sexual lust that they said, okay, if I burn with sexual lust, I will have another type of burning to get rid of that, and that they would burn themselves so that they might not think in a lustful way. And they were doing all that they could. They, they would fast for long amounts of times. Even in non-Christian traditions. When we were in West Africa, you would have men who would take, you know, take part in the ascetic acts, 
And so what you would have is you would have people who would take the fast of Ramadan and they would not eat or drink during the daylight hours and their lips would be cracked. And they would always make sure they, they showed you how cracked their lips were. They would go to Friday prayer, and on Friday prayer, you would have men in their business suits, and they would go to prayer at 3 o'clock on Friday, and they would pray, and part of the prayer is they put their forehead to the ground, and they, they would get the sand upon their foreheads, and none of them would wipe it away. And they would come into the office because it was a badge of honor for them because they wanted to say, see what I've been doing? I've been praying. What have you been doing? See my cracked lips? I've been fasting. What have you been doing? A self-made religion is what it is. He says, don't let, anybody, don't let anybody disqualify you by acts of asceticism. Oh, this is how I'm going to get closer to God. We look at the example, for example, of Elijah. Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And the prophets of Baal are going all around that big old giant sacrifice, you know, and they're cutting themselves and crying out to God that maybe God would hear them because they've cut themselves Oh, God, in my torment, maybe now you will hear me. That is not how you get God's attention. That is self-made religion. The reality is that God remembers us, and God pays attention, and God gives us exactly what we need in Jesus Christ. Disqualifying you, insisting on, on asceticism or worship of angels, which is strange for us. I look at this, and I, I think of my congregation, I think, all right, which one of them is worshiping angels? You know, I'm just trying to think, how does, how does that work? But it is interesting, though. It is interesting in Western society, at least especially. Let's go back the last 10 or 20 years or so. Uh, if you go back the last 10 or 20 years, there was really quite an obsession with angels. Was, yeah, let me, let me go, prove that to you. Uh, a couple of names for you. Uh, angels in the Outfield movie, Touched by an Angel, television show, Michael Landon, Highway to Heaven, played an angel. Here's irony, John Travolta played, yes, yes, John Travolta played Michael, the archangel, yes. And so my point is simply this, I remember, I remember when the O.J. Simpson, O.J. Simpson, when he murdered his wife, because he did. Um, when O.J. Simpson murdered his wife, the whole family was there, and on their lapels, all of them had not a cross but an angel, which I thought was interesting. And there is this interest in the supernatural, but sometimes it's the supernatural to the side. It's not at Christ, but it's someplace else. We're interested in the spiritual, but we don't want to get to Jesus. That's a little too close. Interesting, I think. So you say, well, we don't really necessarily worship angels so much in the 21st century, but I'm here to tell you that there is a fascination with that just spiritual. Most people today will even tell you, well, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism or worshiping angels or watching television or movies about angels or going on in details about visions. Have you ever had, talked to somebody who's had a vision before? I have. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. I've had all kinds of people tell me, oh, I've had this vision, I've had that vision. And, and, and uh, this one guy, he was great. He's, he, was, he was telling me, he says, yeah, I had a vision, and he's telling me all about it. And he, says, and he says, what do you think? And I said, well, are you sure it's from the Lord? Well, I did have pizza last night. That was his response. <laughs> My point is this. It's a little bit subjective, you know. You know, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's a little hard to go ahead and prove that. But I, I do tell you this, though. The next line describes him pretty well. He says, going on a detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. And he was pretty excited to the fact that God had revealed to him in this vision, this whatever it was. I don't even remember what it was. And it's a little hard for us to, to prove, oh, you didn't have that vision. How do you disprove that? It's a little difficult. But I think it's worthwhile asking the question, are you sure it's from the Lord? But here you have some people with a quasi-religiousness and some quasi-religious activities. And if you do all of these things, we can add it to Christ and we can have Christ plus and therefore it's better. And I'm here to tell you today, just as I told you last week, that is subtraction by addition. Because what we need is Jesus Christ and we need him as the center of all things. We need to have him as the center of our thinking, our actions, and not self-made religion. And not holding to the head. See, that's the issue. 
They're not holding to the head. They're not getting the source of their spiritual nourishment from the head that is Christ. And not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body is nourished and knit together through its joints and its ligaments. This is not a biology class, by the way, but it's the idea that everything flows from the head. Grows with the growth that is from God. Our growth comes from Jesus Christ and our relationship with him and not from these things. Hmm. I'm here to tell you, though, sometimes we fall into man-made religion. Happens all the time. I did a class once upon a time. I think I even did it here at this church, but it's long ago. You've probably forgotten. And I said, you know, there's different ways where people emphasize how they worship God. They do. Some people say, well, in the worship of God, how do we worship God? How do we make God pleased with this? Or what is the primary thing which we do uh, to see, to say, oh, this is how, how Christ is, is honored. And I'll start with what we do an awful lot. We study the Bible. We study, we study, we study. We preach the word. And I'm for that, by the way. I preach the Bible. I teach the Bible. I read the Bible. I encourage you to do that. I'm all for it. Go, go, go. But it's possible to study and forget Jesus. It's possible to know all of the answers and forget Jesus. I know the churches, they say, well, it's not so much the study, which is important, but it's the experience. We need to go there. We need to rock out, jam on, dude, have a good time there. And uh, Jesus, woo -hoo! and forget Jesus. We can get psyched with the music and forget Jesus, and we can. Just as with the study, you can study all kinds of stuff and forget Jesus. You can say, well, I go to church, and the reason I go to church is because I love the people there, and I love the relationships that I have there. My favorite time is not the pastor's preaching, it's not the music, but it's the time, that, that little tiny bit of time where we get to stand up and get to shake hands, and we get to have that relationship, and we have potlucks every once in a while, and this is the best day ever. And in those relationships, that's where I find the glory of the church, and you can forget Jesus. That's a social club, folks. And the church is social, and the church should have social things, but it is not the primary. And the church has scripture, and it has the Bible, and it should study those things. But if we forget Jesus, we have a problem. Pharisees did that. We can have an experience, and experience is good, and hallelujah for that. But if we're forgetting Jesus, it's a problem. We can have contemplation and then get lost in your thoughts. You can have work and say, well, I will work for Christ and I will show my worship of him through my work, yet instead of remembering Christ, you are involved with the social gospel. You can say, well, we have form, I love the form, I love the liturgy, and you focus, quite frankly, simply upon the forms and not the substance. All of these things in and of themselves or a combination of these things are good in and of themselves. However, if there is a forgetfulness of who is the head, if there's a forgetfulness of Christ, then you have forgotten that which is essential, and therefore everything else is garbage. Asceticism without or giving up things or fasting of things without a reference towards Christ is garbage. It is addition or subtraction by addition. We have to be careful that we do not abuse forms. We have to remember this. We are to be vitally attached with Christ. And how are we vitally attached with Christ? Are you seeking Christ out in your prayer? Are you reading Scripture in a way that says, okay, that's what Christ has done for me? Are you gaining new understanding of what he has done and a new appreciation? If with Christ you died, to the elemental or the elemental spirits of the world, to the ABCs of the world, to the, the basic things of the world, we saw this word beforehand in chapter 2 and in verse 8. If with Christ you have died with these type of things, why? Why in the world? Why as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? These are not new rules for you to apply. These are examples of rules which... The false teachers are using. Do not, submit, uh, do not submit to, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Funny, I had, a, um, I had an old pastor friend of mine, he was teaching this. His wife, of course, was in the class, and he says, what do you think about this? And she raised her hand. She says, I think those are very good rules for people who are not married yet. 
The only problem is, is that these particular rules, are, these are examples of things which you're not supposed to be uh, advocating here. And what they're doing is they're saying, okay, hey, uh, uh, don't, don't look at that, or don't taste it, don't look at it, even be far away from it. It's kind of a, a progression away. That's what you have here. That, 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 that's not what we're looking for. We're not looking for man-made religion. Referring to things that perish as they are used. I mean, if you have regulations on food, as soon as it's eaten, by the way, it's no longer food. It's gone. It's crazy. All this is according to human precepts and teaching. Verse 23. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body. They look good. But they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. The monks who used to burn themselves to go ahead and rid themselves of sexual lust, guess what? They continued to burn themselves because they still had lust. My friend Mike, Mike Alloway, he's with the Lord now. Mike was um, a sighted man and was in a car accident. And in the car accident, he lost completely his vision. Couldn't see a thing. So Mike was an interesting guy. Mike always liked to talk theology, you know, here and there. And one day I came up to Mike and said, hey, Mike. I said, so tell me. I said, y your eyes don't work. He says, no, of course they don't work. I said, I said, so does that mean that you don't lust anymore? He says, oh, no. He says, that doesn't go away. I could pluck my own eyes out and it would still be there. It's still there. I, I, I can't get rid of it. The reality is, is what he has to do is he has to once again focus in upon Christ and what Christ has done. And this is the key. Not about self-made religion. Not about self-made uh, legislation. But upon what Christ has done and get his nourishment from Christ and not from his own ways. Hmm. They have indeed an appearance of wisdom. They look good. They look smart. They have the appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism, severity of the body, but they have no value. No value. As a matter of fact, all they are is a distraction from what you're supposed to be doing. Subtraction by addition. More is not always better. Not if it's distracting from the head. This may sound a bit radical, but here it is. Jesus is to be the center of your Christianity. That should not have to be said, but there it is. Because we're really good at saying, Jesus plus. No. Stop doing that. We are not called to make a new law. We are called to live by the Spirit. We are called to live in the way of love. We are called to, yes, abide by the prohibitions of Scripture. Yes, to take it in account the weaker brother or sister. But we are not to say, well, this is what pleases Christ ultimately. It is, or this is what pleases God ultimately. It is Christ. We find our vitality. We find our strength in Him. I go back to the words of Jesus in John chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide, rest, remain. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides, it rests, it remains in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, whoever abides in me and I in him. He it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Nothing. Our spiritual benefit, what, we, we can do nothing of spiritual value outside of Christ and not for him. If anyone does not abide in me, he is to be thrown away like a branch that withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown to the fire and burned. Folks, we are to be a people who try over and over again, to keep our spiritual life vital. 
always saying it is about Jesus. It is about Jesus. It is about Jesus. And it's one of the great reasons why prayer is so important for us. For one of the things which we must do as a people of God is to be praying more because it is in prayer we are more and more attached to him. Okay? We are finding our source of strength in him and not in our man-made religion. For our man-made religion, what does it say? It profits us nothing. So let us be people about Christ. Amen.